The Word of God is read in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 9, the Apostle Paul says, God is faithful by whom ye were called unto the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Now let's read verse 10 all together. Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. I wanted to talk to you in this wonderful morning, and we're going to just be focusing on the book of 1 Corinthians. Obviously, we're going to be jumping to two other scriptures apart from 1 Corinthians, but I wanted to talk to you about uh, true unity. And usually when we talk about unity, uh, a lot of people make reference to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 9. And I'm going to read that one more time. Where the Apostle Paul said, God is faithful uh, by whom you were called unto the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Um, before I get to that, I, I want us to understand uh, why Paul was writing this first letter to the church in Corinth. But one of the things that uh, we learn here in this wonderful uh, first letter of the Apostle Paul was that he was writing because there had been divisions that had uh, been sparked among the brothers and sisters in the local church of Corinth. And Paul was trying to address the reason of this division. And Paul, after saluting the church, and we're going to also make reference to verse two later on. But after Paul salutes the church in his first epistle in chapter one, verse nine, Paul says something very important to the church in Corinth. And he says to them first that God is faithful. How many of you believe God is faithful? Amen. And he says God is faithful. But then he has a comma. And remember that when we're reading the word of God, when there's a period or a comma, there's a separation. And there's a reason why God permitted for these commas or these or run on sentence or these or these periods to be placed in the word of God. There's a reason behind this. And Paul is saying in verse nine, God is faithful. And we all understand this. But then he says, by whom ye were called unto. And I want to focus there on the word fellowship. Now, I know that in the past, when we read this scripture, when many people read these scriptures or many of the Bible commentaries that exist today, they only make a superficial commentary on the scripture fellowship. When they look at the word fellowship, they look at it as if you, what you and I are doing in this morning or what you and I would probably do after a great service. We would leave this place and we'd go to the fellowship hall. And the reason that they call it the fellowship hall, because it's supposedly a place where we all come together and we are sharing one with another in Christ. And Paul is saying here, God is faithful by whom ye were called unto the fellowship of who? Of his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Now, Paul using the word here fellowship really doesn't mean what you and I want it to mean. You see, when we read the Word of God or when we read the Bible, you and I read it in what language right now? We're reading it in English, correct? A lot of us know English here. Those that know Spanish, when you read the Bible in Spanish, you read it in Spanish. And automatically, when we see the word fellowship, we, it comes to our mind the modern definition of the word fellowship. So then you read the scripture and you just say, oh, well, yes, God is faithful. Oh, yes, and God has called us unto his fellowship through his son, Jesus Christ. And you automatically think, well, I know what that word means because I know the translation in the modern English language. But you see, the word of God or the Bible, much better said, was written in three major languages. We have the Hebrew in the Old Testament, which was not just one dialect of Hebrew, which was over 300 dialects of Hebrew just found in the Old Testament. Then we have the Greek that was written in uh, and then the New Testament that was written in Greek. And then we have Jesus who spoke in Aramaic. And, and there was also parts in the Bible that we found written in Aramaic. But then we get those original languages. And then there's the target language to the translation. And for us, it's the King James Bible. And we have the literal translation of the King James, which is the text received. So we have all these biblical languages that have been translated to our language today so that we can understand it. 
Now, when we moved here from California, it was very hard to translate for people from Tennessee because there are some words in the South that we don't use in English in California. And, that's, and we still hit those speed bumps today when we're translating. But what I'm trying to say is that when we read the Bible, we should not read the Bible with a mindset of, oh, it says fellowship, and I know the definition in English, then it's just fellowship. There's something more to what Paul is saying. Because you have to remember when Paul was writing 1 Corinthians, there was a major problem in the local church. There was a great division. And we read that great division in verse 12. Go with me to verse 12. Why was Paul saying and why did Paul speak about unity? Was because in verse 12, Paul tells him, Now this I say, listen to what Paul is saying, that every one of you saith, Oh, I am of Paul. And I am of Apollos. And I am of Cephas, which was Peter. And I of Christ. So in other words, Paul is telling him in verse 12, we have a problem. We have a major problem here. Paul is saying the problem is that in verse 13, he asks the question. What does it say? Is Christ divided? Hmm? That is the question that Paul asks. And I think I actually wrote true unity in Christ as the title, but I would have liked to put that title instead. Is Christ divided for the message? Now, let's go back to verse nine and let's. Find out what the word fellowship really means. You see, that word fellowship in Greek means that we are to be called into a community. But listen to what that word fellowship also means. The word fellowship in Greek means a pledge. So if you were to go home today and you go, you can go to the Blue Letter Bible on, online or you go to Google and you find out. What does the word fellowship in Greek mean? You're going you're gonna to get uh, uh, these definitions. And one of those definitions says that the word Greek here, that uh, the word fellowship here that Paul used in Greek means a pledge. And then if you go to the, to, the, uh, to the dictionary and you say, well, what is the definition of the word pledge? The dictionary tells me that the definition of the word pledge means a solemn covenant or promise. Or a solemn undertaking. So now this automatically makes me think, well, wait a minute. The word fellowship really doesn't mean what Webster is telling me that it means on the outside. Because if I look at Webster today and I say, what does fellowship mean? Webster tells me that fellowship means just a friendly association, especially with people who share one's interests. So if we were to use that definition... With the scripture here where it says God is faithful by whom you were called into fellowship, then we would think, oh, well, that means that we should be associated and we should be friendly with each other because we all believe in Christ. But Paul isn't saying this in verse nine. Paul is talking about a pledge or a covenant or a promise that they had taken as members of the church, which in turn brought them into fellowship with who? Paul says it there in verse nine. With his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. So if we read it in the context of what the original Greek is telling us, then we would read it as follows. God is faithful by whom ye were called in the covenant that you took to become one with his son, Jesus Christ. Now, why would Paul say that? Yes, we know the answer is in verse 12. But Paul was speaking about a solemn pledge that as members of the church they had taken, which in turn brought them, whether they were Jew or whether they were Gentile, under the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ. Paul is not speaking about just a regular fellowship in the modern sense as you and I read it and understand it today. And I'm going to go back to this. This is why it's very important I remember Sister Dehart, you said this when we were doing our Sunday school um, conference last year. About when we read the Bible, it's good to have a Bible dictionary right next to you to understand some of the words. And when we read the scriptures, we have to have in mind, as mentioned prior to this, that there were three main languages, Hebrew, Greek and Aramaic. 
And in a branch of theology, there's a word known by the name of hermeneutics, which is the science which deals with interpretation, especially to the text in the Bible. But it doesn't mean that you and I can interpret the Bible privately and say, oh, well, this scripture means this to me, and this is why I'm going to preach it. As many do today when you have these false teachings and doctrines of prosperity. You know why the Bible doesn't teach it? Because 2 Peter 1 and 20 says, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. It's not for us to interpret it. But the interpretation that it is cited here in hermeneutics is to understand the background of the words we're reading in the cultural context, in the historical root meaning. So when you and I read the Bible through the lenses of translation, which in turn makes it difficult for us in many ways to try to understand profoundly what God is telling us in his word. This is why the Bible says not just to read the Bible, it says to search out the scriptures. What does that mean? To delve deep into the word of God and say, God, what are you really trying to tell me in this scripture? I read this and I said, well, why did Paul say he called unto the fellowship? What fellowship is Paul talking about? And Paul is talking right there of a covenant that they had taken that made them one in Christ. There was no reason to be separated and to be in different factions. And I'm of him and I'm of Sister Werner. I am of uh, Sister Dehart. I'm of Brother Steve. No, he said, we're all of Christ. Is Christ divided? When you took that pledge, Paul is telling them, did it mean that you were going to be divided or you were going to be in Christ as one? Now, seeing that we have established this, that the word fellowship means pledge. And it's much more than the modern definition. We must ask ourselves, what does Paul really mean when he says fellowship? 99% of Bible commentaries, and I'll tell you this, I looked at almost, I had this whole table in in my kitchen full of Bible commentaries, and I said, I'm going to see what each one of them says about this word fellowship. And some of them skip this scripture. Do you know there's some commentaries that say, I don't understand, I'm just going to skip it. And some say, no, well, it talks about other things. And 99% of Bible commentaries which are great in context and share that this word fellowship here simply means fellowship first with Christ and with one another. You read it. That's what they're going to tell you. Oh, that means fellowship with Christ and with one another. And that helps us not to be divided. And yes, it's true to a certain degree. Yes. But this is just a superficial understanding of the deepness of what Paul is saying here. Paul is speaking of the covenant we take in the church. To come into fellowship with Christ and one another in the body of Christ. This is is deep what Paul is saying. So Paul is saying, hey, remember that God is faithful. And the one who called you into fellowship through that covenant to be one in him and one with one another. Not to be separate. This is the same fellowship. And go with me real quick to the book of Ephesians chapter 3, verse 9. I'm going to give you opportunity. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 9. I'm going to go there with you too with my Bible here. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 9. You know that there's something that has been lost today, which is the art of finding scriptures. Because it's very easy for trans or interpreters to find them on their... their, uh, On their phones or on their iPads. It makes them much easier. But don't lose the heart of finding scriptures with your fingers. Ephesians chapter 3 verse 9. Listen to what Paul says here. Is everybody there with me? Amen. You just say amen. 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 All right. Ephesians chapter 3 verse 9 says. And to make all men see. See what? What is the fellowship? Uh Uh-oh. It's the same Greek word he used in the beginning of Corinthians. He says to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery. So Paul is telling us here that this fellowship is a mystery. Hmm? Which from the beginning of the world hath been hidden God. Uh Oh, but what does it say? Who created all things by Jesus Christ. 
So 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 9, the same word fellowship is being used again by Paul in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 9. But in this sense, in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 9, Paul is saying that this fellowship is a mystery. But it doesn't mean that this mystery shall remain mysterious. Because God has revealed to us in these last days what this fellowship of the mystery means. And it is only through what we know today as divine revelation. Now, divine revelation doesn't mean that I'm going to have a revelation that is so divine that it is outside of the word of God. Just like many today practice in different churches. You've seen, you've seen today many uh, preachers will get up there and they'll call out somebody and they say, God is telling me to tell you this and this and that. And then we got to be real careful and it's real dangerous for somebody to come and say that God has told him something that may not be written, written in the word of God. We must test what is being said with the word of God. But Paul is using the same word here, fellowship, in Ephesians 3, 9, that he used in 1 Corinthians 1, 9. Here, Paul says, like I said, that fellowship is a mystery that was hidden, Paul said, in God. So it was hidden in God in the beginning of the world. But in verse 10 of Ephesians chapter 3, he tells us that it is no longer a mystery because it has been revealed. Go back with me again. Ephesians chapter 3. So in verse 9, Paul says it is a mystery that was hidden with God from the beginning. But what does verse 10 say? To the intent that now unto the principalities and power in heaven, heavenly places, it may be known to who? Look, look at what it says. Might be known by who? By the church. Known what? The mainful wisdom of God. So the definition and the mystery of fellowship has been revealed unto the church. Isn't that amazing? Not an individual, but it's been revealed unto the church. Not in any organization, a group of people, but it has been revealed unto the church of God found in the scriptures. He says to the intent that now unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places by me might be known by the church, the mainful wisdom of God. We've had Jehovah Witnesses come knocking on our door and then they say that they have the wisdom of God. And we tell them, well, who was the wisdom of God revealed unto the Jehovah Witness? Show me a scripture that it was real to the Jehovah Witness. And they can't. And then we take out the Bible and say it was real to the church. You want to know where? And we show them Ephesians chapter 3, verse 10. And they have no argument against that. Now, Paul is telling us that the church membership, something very important concerning the covenant that he administered to them as a minister of the gospel. Now, go to 1 Corinthians. Now, we're going to go to the scripture that I had mentioned before. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 2. Now, in verse 2, we're going to see two different groups of people here. Listen to what it says. Unto the church of God. Okay. So we know that it's talking to one group called the church of God. Unto the church of God, which is located where? In Corinth. And he refers to them as them that are sanctified in Christ. Jesus. And then he also calls them Saints. So he says unto the church of God at Corinth, to them that are sanctified in Christ called to be saints. The first part of his salutation makes a clear distinction between the church and the kingdom. He directs himself to the church of God and describes the members of the church of God as sanctified, which means to be separated unto the Lord. And then he says that they're also called saints. So in other words, he's saying that the church has been called to be separate. And that goes together with the Greek definition of the word church, which means, which in, in Greek is called iglesia. This is where we get the Spanish word iglesia from, which means the called out. So in other words, Paul in his first salutation here in verse two, the first part he says, 
unto the church of God. In other words, unto those that have been called out, those that have been sanctified in Christ, those that have been called to be saints. So Paul, after addressing the membership of the church, now he directs himself. And let's, let, let, look at your scripture here. Unto the church of God, which is at Corinth, comma, to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, comma, called to be saints, comma. Now let's go to the second part of the scripture. So after he calls the church of God, then he says, with all that are, that in every place call upon the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours. He's talking about, he's talking about another group now. So he says, first he says, to the church of God, and then he says, and then to who? To all that are in every place. Now, what does that word all in Greek mean? It means invited to those that have been invited to proclaim the gospel of the eternal salvation through the kingdom of Christ. So here Paul is telling us in verse 2 that there's a distinct difference between members of the body of Christ and members of the kingdom of God. There's two distinctives here because we see the scripture and we see the comma that separates both of these salutations. He says first to the church of God, and then he directs himself to all that in every place. You remember the apostles came to Jesus and said, hey, we see somebody over there doing things in your, in, in, in your name and doing all this other stuff, but he's not a part of us. And what did Jesus say? If he is not against us, then he is for us. He didn't take the stance that many today in different denominations take. Well, you can't. You can't speak to them because they're Baptists. Or you can't speak to them because they're Presbyterian. Hmm? But if they've been justified by their faith in Jesus Christ, they're members of the kingdom of God. They are brothers and sisters in Christ. Now, Paul says this very firmly. And he reminds them then in this in verse 9. Of their covenant that they took to become one in Christ. How does how do we know Paul reminds them of this covenant? Or how do we know that there was even a, a covenant that took place? Somebody once said, well, the Bible doesn't tell me not to, not to smoke marijuana. Well, the Bible doesn't tell you not to wear socks either. But you still wear them because you need them. Hmm? But we find the essence of it in the word of God. We don't find the word covenant or that they took a covenant to become members, but we find the essence of the covenant. First, we see the word fellowship. Now go with me to 2 Corinthians. I told you we were going to jump around the Bible here. 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 2. And if you have a pen, mark these down, go home and study them. It'd be wonderful to, for you to study and to see what we can see in this morning. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 2. Paul says in verse 1, he said, I, in other words, Paul says, I, I would to God that you would bear with me a little in my folly. In other words, in my uh, cabeza loca. Huh? You would help me. You would be careful with me and indeed bear with me. Why does he say that? Because in verse 2, he says, for I am jealous over you. This is a godly jealousy. This is not that type of jealousy that's malice. He said, I'm jealous over you. Godly jealousy. Why does he say this? He says, for I have. Somebody say that word. I have espoused you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. What, is, what, what does espoused mean? Hmm? Why does Paul say this? I'm jealous over you. That word espouse means that it is something that has been brought together, something that has been fit together. It is the same word used together when a man and a woman come into a perpetual covenant of marriage. When they say, do you take Bernice to be your wife and this and she, do you take Nathan? And we both said yes in front of God. At that moment, God brings them together and no longer are they two, but now they become one. They have been espoused. The minister administered that covenant, but God was the one that did the coming together. 
And Paul is saying here, I'm jealous over you. Why? Because he says, I have espoused you to one husband. I have administered to you this covenant to one husband who is Jesus. For what? So that he may present to himself a church without spot or wrinkle or any such thing. This is it's amazing when we see this. And just like a covenant is taken in front of God by those witnessing the ceremony of a wedding, the same it is in the church of God. When a person joins to the body of Christ through a covenant in front of God in the church as a witness to this covenant. This is why it's so important that everything that we do be found in the word of God and not apart from God's word. So Paul is saying, and we're going to conclude here in verse nine, God is faithful by whom you were all called unto this covenant. Paul is saying you were called into this covenant and because you were called to this covenant, because you took this covenant to be in fellowship with Christ, to be one with Christ. Paul tells him in verse 10. Now I beseech you. In other words, I'm begging you. Paul says in verse 10. I'm begging you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all speak the same thing. He didn't say all speak the same language. <laughs> he said you all speak the same thing spiritually, hmm? doctrinally, through the word of God, and that there be no divisions among you. So Paul is telling them, hey, we, you, I, took, I administered the covenant to you. I espouse you to Christ. You're one in Christ. You're expected to speak the same thing. You're expected not to be divided. That ye may be perfectly joined together in the same mind. The same purpose he's trying to say here. This is why in the church we preach that there must be unity of doctrine, government, and purpose. Three things that are very important. And, he, and then he says, in the same judgment. Isn't that beautiful? Paul is telling them, come on guys, get it together. Don't you remember the covenant that I administered to you guys? Where I espoused you to Christ? Where you, you promised in front of God and the witnesses, which was the church, that you would take all his word, that you would live by his word, that you would love his word. And Paul is saying, remember that when you did that, it brought you into fellowship with Christ. Not with Apollos, he says in verse 12, not with Paul, not with, he said with Christ. And then he says in verse 10, for it has been declared unto me of you, my brethren, by them which are of the house of Chloe. So Chloe got a hold of a letter and she said, I'm going to write to Paul our overseer and tell him, hey, this and this is going on here. You got to come and take care of this. She was concerned. And what happened? That there are contentions among you. Now I say that everyone that says I'm of Paul, I'm of Apollos, I'm of Cephas, and I'm of Christ. And then he says, is Christ divided? And the answer is no. How can he be divided? If we all have taken the same covenant to be one in his body. When we understand truly what it is. To be in fellowship with Christ and to be espoused unto Christ. This is why the Bible says he's coming back for a church or a bride without spot or wrinkle or any such thing. And history has already been won. Because in the book of Revelation, it says that John saw the bride of Christ who had made herself ready. Isn't that beautiful? Don't you want to be a part of that? Want to be fitly joined together with Christ, espoused with Christ in harmony and in unity. When we have that in our mind, that each one of us is in fellowship with Christ, then that's going to help us to strive to come together and love one another. And yes, some are not perfect. Yes, there's a, one minister once said, there's a few bad apples, brother. Yeah, it's true. But who, who are we looking at? Are we looking at what's around us or are we looking at Christ? Hmm? And when we're looking at Christ, we know that whatever happens, the church will reach her goal. A.J. Tomlinson, our first general overseer, said they asked him, well, where do you find the church of God? He said, you'll find it where there's wolves. <laughs>
where there's division, where there's gossip, where there's backbiting. Why, he said, because we're working to get to perfection. He was, what he was trying to say is don't look at those things. Look at Christ.